And now I'm pleased to open the floor to questions. Yes. On. Really interesting stuff. Um, and I guess one of the themes of the conference so far has been that the technological changes of the last decades have tended to concentrate income rather than expand opportunities. And I guess I have a question along those lines for um, pretty much all of the panelists. Starting with Mathilde, Mathilde in the, you gave a very optimistic view of the gig economy. But a less optimistic view would be that it has allowed employers to break cartels, including labor unions and capture most of the technological rents associated with these new technologies. Um, the, the idea being that you've replaced organized labor on one hand with monopsonistic employers who, and, and employees who can't organize themselves. Um, clearly that could be redressed by public policy, but it hasn't been. And I'm a cynic, and in my view, whenever you have concentrated corporate interests on one side and consumers and labor on the other, it's always the corporate interests that win. Uh, I guess it, it reminds the, the point that Natasha was making about IoT and, and, uh, the, the, and recycling raised similar questions because, yes, it could be used to encourage or make recycling easier. It could also be used sim simply to improve inventory control on, for, by firms, which is not a bad thing, but also to evade regulation, to engage in and firms now engage in transfer pricing. They could use this to engage in actual transfer to evade regulation, taxation, things like that. So I guess my question, which I suppose is also relevant to the regulator, is how can we think of either inherent characteristics of the technologies or public policies that could make sure that these technological innovations benefit society more broadly rather than simply providing, providing more profits, more rents, to the corporations that are the principal users of the technologies. Matilda, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for your, um, thank you very much for your um, question. And actually, I'm very glad you, you asked it. And I will still be optimistic um, because, well, I didn't give specific example, but uh, so for sure, uh, it's complicated for self-employed contractors to actually be together to, to have a union and then talk to the platform. Um, but then I came up to know about, um, so let's say we have digital problem, but we also have digital solutions. And um, so Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, they actually uh, developed a forum, an online forum, where they will gather um, their, uh, their thoughts about how to improve their working conditions or how to, um, well, how they see the, their jobs, and gathering uh, all these thoughts, voting which, um, which ideas are worth spreading. And I think at some point they are going to send something to, to Jeff Bezos. So, I mean, it's one solution, but still for me there's already some potentials which are also digital in that case. So I still remain optimistic. Okay, yeah, please. Go ahead. Bonjour, uh, Tatsuo Masa from Japan. I have a question to probably Mathilde again. Hearing all these wonderful presentations, this is a very awakening. Thank you for this. One, one thing coming to my mind is uh, technology divide. We used to call it a digital divide, but coming all these digital things deep rooted into technology, there could be a technology divide. For example, if you see Sub-Saharan Africa, quite a few people still don't have electricity at home. So they have no access whatsoever about anything digital or data. So those people could be easily left behind all these advancement in the 20th century. And another thing is people who cannot understand all these things about technology, they are also left behind. So there could be risk of widening gap between on the side of the technology and who are left behind or even no access. So how do you reconciliate all these risk of divide coming from all these development? Thank you. Natasha, you want to take this one? Yeah. Well, I think it also 
goes back to the, the previous question I think was interesting. And I think we often ask, how is the current construct going to survive with technology, right? That's sort of the premise of how is policy going to regulate technology? And I think the question almost has to be changed is how is policy and how is the system framework going to change in light of technology, right? Because I actually think big data will reinvent capitalism. Right, and we have new technologies that are like blockchain that are destabilizing the current construct of bank and finance and the peer-to-peer -peer market. So I think there's you know more shift actually that technology will impact policy and how to kind of create that change in tandem rather than just the policy framework surviving with technology. Um, and then I think your your other question around where is you know where does this leave people behind? I think that's absolutely true, and I think that's a scary thing, and I think that's where a lot of policy work does need to collaborate to figure out how we can make technology more open and accessible. When you were when you were in the 40s, everybody sort of had this one vision of what the youth would be in the future, and they knew where their job would be. Um, and today, I think a lot of the terms people just you know either of this generation or younger generations and in different parts of the world don't necessarily feel that they have access to positions in blockchain or positions in IoT. And I think that's definitely an education reframing and, and a skill set um, that maybe can go along with some of the work in the gig economy um, that, that will need to happen. But I think that's somewhere where policy work does, does need to step in to support making this an open ecosystem um, and how to bring more people into this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, please. Good morning, James. Can we uh, follow up on that question for the panel. So if, if we are actually talking about changing the way that we approach policy, what is, what is a suggestion that you might have for governments around the world to take the first step in doing that? Because as we, as we know, governments are risk averse. We must move slowly and carefully and protect our data, as was mentioned, and have valid regulations. But how is it then that, that to keep up with technology in industries like yourselves, how, how would governments take that first step to actually rethink or interact with you to be able to reframe a policy framework going forward? Actually, I think, um, it's for governments, it's the same thing like, like it has been for the uh, bigger corporations who try to get connection with young entrepreneurs, uh, tech enthusiasts, startups, uh, by creating uh, accelerator programs or initiatives uh, where they work, can work together. Just to get the communication right and uh, to get the conversation starting. I think this is the most crucial part, to start talking together and uh, finding the, the mutual benefits that you can get. I mean, you have something to add? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, James, for your question. Um, I think we, well, as I mentioned, of course, uh, government need to invest in uh, this digital transformation and make sure they have all the right resources, like human resources, financial resources, uh, training. I think training is very important because if you just go digital and no one knows how to use the tools, or uh, it's not going to be more efficient in the end. So uh, I think training will be a very important part of uh, what we are trying to do uh, at the Nuclear Safety Authority. Uh, and my other uh, thought about um, what you said is uh, maybe the government should also um, listen a little bit more to what the public is expecting. And maybe um, the way we open the data should correlate with what people need, uh, what our, their questions are. So we're, um, we're trying to do some uh, public um, meetings or debates uh, around the nuclear question. But um, in the end, it's always more uh, it's easier when you are actually answering to the public's questions uh, rather than just, you know, giving a big speech about how cool you are and uh, what your projects are. So I think, yeah, focusing on what uh, the public is expecting is an important part of the question. I think to add one thing to that too is it's often just technology versus government and actually I think the government needs technology more than anybody. Um, the best man for the job is the one with the best resources, the the most efficiency to get it done. And if the government doesn't adapt to have resources to do those things, then they, they won't be sort of the best institution for the job. And that is part of what's going to reshape. So I think government needs to think of technology as an asset instead of this, this other. 
Thank you. Another question? Yes, in the back. Good morning. Um, I find this the discussion we're having very interesting around almost the, the opposition between government and technology. What I do find a bit odd in that, and what I'd love to hear your thoughts on, is governance in a global point of view from that. Because effectively, governments are not globally governing uh, how technology spreads, how we regulate it, how we protect citizens. A lot of the actors are global. Uh, so there's a huge asymmetry there. Uh, I'm thinking data leaks, I'm thinking uh, abuse of information, et cetera. Um, how do we actually address that from a point of view that governments can still protect their citizens as well? Because they have a responsibility beyond the technological to protect their citizens, uh, and currently they don't manage. Thank you. Um, you want to um, yes, thank you for your question. Um, I'm not sure if there's one right answer to it, but I think um, that both sides should have a sense of urgency, because if you look at it from a tech perspective, um, we see business models popping up and scaling up global within years and impacting our lives super fast. Um, but now they're also really running into trouble because we didn't talk to the government. They kept it close by them, uh, didn't give a lot of insights, and now regulators step in and make hard rules. For example, if we look at the shared economy, uh, we had Airbnb spreading across the globe quite fast. And now regulators are stepping in and saying, hey, Airbnb is going to be regulated in the city. And it has a really negative and bad impact on the technology company. Because suddenly they're not allowed to do what they wanted to do. So I think there's, for the technology companies, there should be a sense of urgency to early in the development of the technology start the conversation. And I think sometimes the technology companies like us, we feel that we are experts on uh, the technology and that we, because we are experts, kind of think, okay, all others can't follow, so let's leave it. But I think it's important that we, that the technology companies try to explain what they are doing and really in an early phase already talk to the governance about how this could work out. Because in the end, I think that will also benefit the technology companies. So ju just to add, because this question came uh, uh, already a few times, I will give you one example uh, on this where we really have to work together. It's, uh, it's notably in the space of cybersecurity. Uh, we, it is a, a, a real issue uh, for, uh, because for co the corporate world. Uh, we are caught in a kind of uh, asymmetric warfare. Uh, because uh, one of the most uh, advanced persistent threats come from uh, from government and uh, corporations are used either as target or channels uh, to uh, get to the the target and uh, probably some of you might be aware uh, Brad Smith the general counsel of Microsoft has launched an initiative called the Tech Accord uh, with the objective to create a kind of Geneva Convention around uh, cybersecurity because we need to rule. This is, this is the, the, the Wild West currently. Uh, this costs a fortune to the economy. Uh, this places mistrust in technology, rightly so, because uh, uh, things happen that should not happen. And uh, we have joined this initiative called Tech Accord, and uh, we will support that. that that's really a, a place where uh, the industry, uh, uh, the technology industry, uh, with other Corporation that are uh, highly digital and, and the government have to come together and, and set up a certain number of rules. So uh, we heard about the climate, and I think in cybersecurity in particular, this is an area where we have to act together and develop a policy at global level because we will not be able to manage it otherwise, and it is completely undermining the development that you have seen. Now, there are other domains uh, where it's less obvious uh, to uh, develop a consensus. Uh, I, I, I give one example. I think we are behind uh, on a debate in ethics, uh, notably when it comes to artificial intelligence. I will give one, one example is uh, when you develop uh, an algorithm, an engine that will crunch a lot of data, 
you do it with bias. You cannot avoid, you, we all have personal bias, we all have cultural bias, so the way you will address a problem with technology in different parts of the world will not be the same. How do you take this into account, uh, and notably from a government perspective, uh, uh, while you develop your technology? It's very difficult to engage uh, uh, this conversation right now, probably because it is somewhat abstract. While on cybersecurity, we, can, we, can, we are very active because people feel it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I think, yes, it's something that a forum like the World Policy Conference also should help develop and say what, what would be the agenda, what would be the topics. So I said the, the obvious is cybersecurity. There are other ones where we, we don't have yet the understanding about how critical it is while these developments are taking place. So just to complement uh, from uh, the, the panel uh, of our young leaders. Another question? If not, I thank you very much. I hope we could show you uh, the different perspective on, uh, and I can tell you we have a large organization. Uh, vast majority are young people in our organization. They are quite determined, they move extremely fast, they are extremely focused, and they are pro focused on problem solving. So what you just heard will just happen, like it or not, because they, they know they have to face it. So thank you very much.